this evening we've got a quick roundup of UK news and we'll ask anybody who can to tell us what's been going on in their local area. Then we've got Rafe Smith from the Transport Action Network um, giving us an update on uh, DFT's active travel funding cuts and what's been going on there. Um, and then we've got Leo Murray from Possible uh, on their school run traffic congestion tool. So there's absolutely loads to get into um, this evening uh, over the next hour and a bit. So uh, let's do the UK roundup first. And H, super keen, you've got your hand in the air. Tell us what's been happening near you. Yeah, well, I've been catching up with, uh, there was a the session on electric bike specs that Philip Darnton was at. Um, but also we've been having a lot of issues with electric mopeds. And there seems to be a, 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 a need to get a public understanding of what an EAPC is and what an electric moped is and how to regulate the use of electric mopeds by food delivery riders. Uh, in Scotland, we have um, a legal situation whereby we can actually license street trading. So we've never had the problems with uh, public bike hire because they've had to have a license as street trading. And Just Eat, Deliveroo and such like could be made to have a license, which means they have to regulate and maintain their riders. Uh, we've had um, some of these electric bikes confiscated or mopeds confiscated and um, tested by the police at speeds of over 35 miles an hour. And it's very obvious when they're in use because they're not pedaling and they're still whizzing past you. So um, that's that one. We've also had a, a company called Getir that's folded. Uh, I don't know if they've been operating in England. I haven't seen them in Scotland, but it's uh, one of these delivery companies. Um, Urbit's failed in Scotland. Urbit's failed in various other locations. And um, it, it's, it's a tendency of, again, the gig economy um, using these bikes. And um, we, we need to get some kind of uh, working model for this. It's a good way of delivering, but how do we make it work? Thanks, H. Um, all good points. And it sounds to me like that might be something maybe we should return to. We have covered it on Active Travel Cafe before, but um, it's a fast moving space. So maybe we'll come back to that. Thanks, H. Um, I know Bob in particular has strong views on some of these things. Um, any other updates from around the UK from anybody? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Ruth and then Adam. Uh, hi, I was at the Parliamentary Active Travel Showcase, along with a few people that are on here. Uh, it was very interesting. Selene Saxby opened it, and then the Shadow Minister for Transport spoke. He's the Minister for Wakefield. He was very good. And the Minister for Active Travel uh, for the Tories spoke. Uh, he wasn't quite so good, in my opinion, but maybe I'm biased. But um, he did say that they would continue with the drip drip funding, which I said is so damaging and you can't uh, operate like that. He also said that he'd voluntarily taken a downgrading job to take on that post, which kind of shows it all about what they thought. There was a lot lot more. Um, maybe someone else here can say something about it, but it was a good networking place to be and we met lots and lots of wonderful people there. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. And yes, that is quite an extraordinary comment for a minister to say that they've lowered themselves to become a minister. Um, Adam, what's your update? Thanks, Ruth. Um, I, I haven't been to this for a, a few weeks due to a job, but um, um, Bath has done what I think is quite probably one of the bravest sort of low traffic neighbourhood in, interventions they've done, which they basically cut off what was almost uh, almost treated like as a major road. Um, and with about and the, uh, the, they went against something like a uh, petition with about four or five thousand people who signed it. Um, uh, but it's a it's actually I think uh, quite a transformative thing. Um, uh, so yeah, so I was just really pleased to see that sort of political will in that space to kind of get the, try to uh, do the trials at least. Um, but yeah, so if you ever if you are in Bath area, there's a place called Sydney Place, which is around the Sydney Gardens area, and it is amazing the difference just a couple of bollards can make to a road which was really hostile and horrible before lovely thanks adam love a love a bit of good news as we're kicking off brendan what's your update uh yes some of you may recall a few meetings ago i mentioned the beer bike seizure in edinburgh um and um the edinburgh festival of cycling is happening at the beginning of june 
and I've organized a public meeting which is going to be streamed and I very much like uh, people here to come along if you can by either means um, to discuss basically the pushing of the limits of what um, a, a bicycle is both in terms of power and throttle control with the uh, current government consultation and size and 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 other questions like uh, H has just mentioned um, primarily because it seems to me that um, uh, we are going to have to accept a lot more larger pedal vehicles if we want to reduce the number of miles driven. Um, so I, I, I will give you further details in good time, but but it will be a discussion with a, hopefully a beer bike operator, um, a lawyer, a local councillor, national cycling organisations, and so on and so on. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Brenton. Yeah, do keep us posted on that uh, and update us in the news roundup when it's where I'm sure lots of people like to join on that. Um, and having when it, this came up in a previous session, I was unaware of the world of beer bikes. I'm now aware of the world of beer bikes and uh, still doing my head a little bit. Um, Leo, let's come to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I don't know if there was an active travel cafe last week. There wasn't uh, before that. So this might have already been done. But Hammersmith Bridge is getting a full cycle lane. So uh, apologies if someone really fed that in last week. But um, it is the DFT. It's the reality dawning, you know, uh, three million pounds committed for uh, proper surfacing uh, post the stabilisation works. So it won't over till November. And they're about to close the temporary lane. So um, which is frustrating. But um, yeah, no promise of any money for reopening its cars nothing in tfl business plan uh almost no mention in manifestos not 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 none of london mayoral manifestos so yeah i think that 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 is a permanent cycle lane going in which will connect in with c9 um and probably be the last thing that happens at the bridge so it's it's exciting although it's a bit premature to be that excited thank you <laughs> that's all right well it's even if it did I, I wasn't here last week leo but even if it was let's let's say it twice because it's very exciting so that's absolutely fine um tim what's your update hi i'm stepping in because uh, i can't see alice ferguson on the call uh so it was safe streets now on saturday and critical mass weekend and quite a lot happened around the country it's uh, Torbay to Inverness, there were actions, um, and I can read out the list of towns and cities that took part, but um, if I just say there were four Bs, Bath, Bedford, Birmingham and Bristol, you'll get a sense of uh, how long it's going to take. Um, the I think the critical mass numbers are up to about 1,800 uh, around the, the country, um, and if you go onto Safe Streets Now uh, website, um, .co.uk, you can uh, catch up with uh, all of the stuff that's happened. Um, we had a very most most of the people on the Leicester demo are on this call. <laughs> Hello, Mike and uh, uh, Rachel. But I got on the telly. I was on ITV uh, Central briefly, uh, as was um, Rachel Wigginton from the county, and uh, I think they also covered the Birmingham uh, event as well, uh, at which uh, head teacher spoke. Uh, very movingly about um, his fears of his children making it to school and home from school, uh, which is what it was really all about. But next time, I'm not going to stand on a quite cold protest. I'm going on the critical mass. Stuff it. <laughs> brilliant. Thanks, Tim. That's really lovely. Absolutely lovely. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Really good news. OK, final one. Chris, we'll come to you and Kirk, please. And then we'll start our presentations. Oh. Chris, we can't hear you. I think your audio isn't connected or you might be on mute. I'll try this. Is that better? Yeah, much better. We can hear you now. Yeah. I can't hear you now, but you can hear me. Right. So um, so we're part of West Yorkshire Combined Authority, which is a tier one. Um, but Kirklees itself would be tier three because we don't have anything and there's no real plan. Um, We've got some greenways that are half decent, but um, at the moment we're having the Trans Transpennine route upgrade done. So two of our, our three greenways have long-term closures on them. One's been closed for a year. It's going to be closed until at least October. 
the another one's being closed last autumn and it's going to be closed for four years. So, I mean, all the active travel is basically gone. Um, though we've started working with the local group and with Sustrans, we had a meeting today about a legacy project through Transpanel Route Upgrade, which will hopefully provide a link, a cycle route between Manchester and York eventually. Um, the other thing is that uh, West Yorkshire have been working on their LC whip um, with the second LC whip. And we haven't heard anything about it for a couple of years. So we managed to get hold of a document um, through an unnamed source this week um, that was produced in January last year, showing the routes available. Um, hopefully that's going to go out to the public at some point after the elections. But it's not ideal. It's not what we want. It's just five routes in each authority, but it's still a step more than what we've had so far. Thanks, Chris. That's ace. Thanks for the update from there. The Manchester to York cycleway sounds very exciting. So we need to know more about that when you can share it. So let us know and we'll get you on to talk about that. Fabulous. Right. Um, that's a really good roundup. Thank you, everybody, for sharing your latest news. We're going to now move on to our first presentation this evening, which is from Ray Smith and Transport Action Network. Rafe, are you there? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can, Rafe. That's perfect. Excellent. Well, just as I try to share my screen, um, I'm really delighted to see so many people here. Uh, as you may be aware, um, next Tuesday, so by this time next week, we will have been in court uh, against the Department for Transport uh, to question its funding cuts um, against uh, active travel. And just hopefully, can you see a screen now? It's just on it. So there we go. Yep. That's all good, Ray. Thanks. Excellent. And is it, um, just make sure it's full, is it full screen or? Not yet. If you click yet, on slideshow sorry. at the top. Let me just, uh... so I need to just go out a second. Uh, um, sorry about this. Technology is a beautiful thing. <laughs> I know. Don't worry at all. It's absolutely fine. Um, here we We're go. We're a very patient, patient bunch. I've got too many screens in front of me. Right. That should work now. Is that better? Yeah, looking great. Excellent. Stuff. So um, here is our interim. This is um, here from Transport Action Network, which is a small NGO that has been trying to make a real difference in this space. And you can see uh, us and some supporters outside the Royal Courts of Justice. Um, this was late last year when we had an interim hearing uh, in this case. And hopefully the, the slogan of help fund healthy travel choices is one that will resonate with uh, the Active Travel Cafe. So just um, quick introductions. Um, I'm slightly hamstrung of what I can and can't say because there's a legal case with special rules next week. So I'll try and kind of whisk through things and have a chance for questions at the end. But there may be some things where I'm like zipped up. I, I can't say things, but who knows what will come out at the court hearing next week. So really, I wanted to very quickly run through what is this um I call it a CWIS, someone else calls it a SWIS, which sounds like a bit, a bit fraudulent, um, but it's the cycling walking investment strategy and also a kind of a one minute rundown on what a judicial review is. Want to also cover the funding situation, uh, climate issues, air quality and next steps. And why this, this is so important now is because the funding cuts made last March uh, started to trickle through this financial year. So for people working in the sector, you'll start to be having, unfortunately, um, the impact of last year's funding cuts coming through now. Um, the CWIS was put into law in 2015. It was actually my idea uh, in about May 2014, so like 10 years ago, uh, and it was supposed to create more funding certainty and long-term ambition for walking and cycling. You know, we had a lot of support from previous prime ministers, but 
as I think everyone here will be aware, the political picture isn't as uh, positive now. So hopefully this case will make a difference. And let me tell you a bit more. So just, just to be clear, our legal challenge is challenging this decision here um, of uh, March 2023, when the government announced you know, a record £40 billion pounds in the next two years, but there'd only be £100 million pounds of dedicated funding for active travel. Mark Harper, the Secretary of State for Transport, pictured here, he said, well, we'll review these levels as soon as practically possible. Now, the eagle-eyed people among you will know there's been quite a few other transport funding announcements since last March. How much extra money has been found for active travel? Well, as far as I'm aware, not a penny. There was a hundred million pounds announced, which I'll come on to, but that was the uh, the kind of the, the funding that was already part of the plan. So, I mean, the question today is, how did we go from active travel being one of the best returns on investment decisions government can make, this was in 2022, to being one that needs to be cut the most? That is uh, a difficult question to answer without all the documents I'm allowed to share, but I'll have a go. So quickly, what is the CWIS? Well, it was modelled on the road investment strategy, which is the kind of a statutory plan for, you know, big roads like motorways and uh, trunk roads. And the idea was that by putting, you know, long term ambitions and then funding uh, into a statement set out to Parliament, that would create more certainty, allowing you know, more people to go into the sector and by having targets, you could check in each year whether you're meeting them and that might help raise ambition. The, the two key bits of, of the CWIS, and I'll, this is the kind of the, the background I have to kind of go through so that you're, you're clear. It's one is to set objectives. So, you know, one of those is to have half of urban trips walked and cycled by 2030, although shorter trips, not all. Um, and then to provide some funding. And the government talks about having provided three billion pounds, although that's not quite the case, and we'll come on to that in a minute. But those are the two key things of what this is about. Now, there's supposed to be a review every few years. And in the meantime, these strategies aren't supposed to be varied except through a formal process. So that is a very, very quick, um, simple view. So why... Why is it important to have a stat a, a document that's backed with a statutory process? Well, let's compare the CWIS with gear change, you know, the, the, the thing that's shown up here. This was you know, far more visual, lots of nice pictures, lots of interesting commitments. But, and here's a confidential ministerial briefing uh, Tan got hold of via some other proceedings. You can see here, that there was no requirement to report on gear change. And because it had no statutory status, um, it was very easy for the government to quietly drop commitments. Um, so this is this is something where the CWIS is, is more important uh, in terms of having, having backing. So what is judicial review? Well, some of you may wish that this would be the sort of case where you could put a transport minister into court and find them guilty, but unfortunately it's not It's not a criminal case. It's a public law or administrative law case, and it doesn't mean the court substitutes their view for that of minister. It's simply looking at whether a decision was made lawfully um, about the process rather than the merits and one of the good things about judicial review is there's a thing called a duty of candour, which means that government bodies have to kind of show the, 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 the reasons, the evidence for decisions that they made. That might turn out to be quite interesting next week. Um, I, I can't say much more uh, than that at the moment. So key questions were, did the government or the public body like comply with legal obligations? And did it take into account all the things that it ought to have done? It's a bit more complex than that, but those are perhaps the, the two key things I can, can flag today. Now, if we are successful, uh, a judge might decide to, to quash, like to cancel, uh, or to declare a government decision unlawful. And then the government would have to make a kind of a to start again. 
So why is this case crucial for active travel now? Well, some of the, the kind of the key questions here are things like, uh, do ministers need to take legal commitments to set targets seriously? Or can they just say, well, you know, we, we had a think, thought about that, but money was a bit short, so we had to, to cut. And, and also we think that some voters don't necessarily like some, some policy measures, so we'll cancel them as well. There's also an issue of whether, you know, active travel budget should be a firm commitment or simply a guesstimate. Um, there's also issues around equalities, um, around climate, and around uh, a new air quality targets. So I was gonna, gonna say, gonna ask the question, maybe some of you would rather be in parliament, but I saw that Ruth and others, quite a few have, you have been at, uh, at this showcase already today and, and, and met government, the minister. And he's he said on social media yesterday that the choice between you know, active travel and driving isn't binary, we can have a happy medium of coexistence. So very much on that theme, um, I wanted to kind of ask, you know, last month there was 100 million pounds of funding announced for active travel. You know, is that something we should be satisfied with? Is that enough to help, you know, meet ambitious targets for a big switch in journeys to be walked and cycled? And of course, here's the classic, you know, pint half full, pint half empty. Um, and you know, is this enough beer? If I can still talk about beer now that you're the active travel cafe to you know get cycling and walking to where it needs to be. Well, let's have a comparison. If you are looking at national highways, um, just one of its road schemes for ten miles of dual carriageway is costing uh, a billion pounds. You know, that's a lot more money and actually a lot worse. Um, benefit cost ratio for that scheme on the right the picture in case you're wondering it's the world record of uh someone carrying beer at oktoberfest um but i think you know maybe walking and cycling doesn't need that uh amount of, of kind of beer or funding but certainly a lot more than it's getting at the moment so one of the key requirements in law is for ministers to consider the desirability of maintaining certainty and stability in funding. Now, here we have a chart from the National Audit Office. Many of you will be uh, have seen its uh, report last summer on active travel. Now, is this stable? Is this, uh, you know, a, a continuous amount of money? Um, doesn't look like it at all, does it? You can see this kind of graph going up and down and actually, if you look at the, the far right uh, for this uh, financial year, it looks as if there was more money estimated as being provided than has actually been announced. So perhaps it's even worse than it looks like. Well, a lot of the money for active travel comes from other funding pots like levelling up. But as you might have seen last month, only 10% of that funding has actually been spent because it's often competition based, it's a lot harder for local authorities to plan on in advance for that funding. And that's a key reason why Tan says that this dedicated funding is so important. So I'll try and increase the pace uh, if that's okay. This is perhaps a key chart showing the original, at the top, the, the funding in, um, in CWIS, where we are kind of officially now, but then at the bottom, you can see with inflation that wasn't planned for at the time of uh, CWIS 2 being announced, there's actually a lot less money, almost half uh, the money for in real terms for walking and cycling. Um, the blue bit is the money that's been cut and then eroded by inflation. And then the yellow is me kind of guessing that only a tenth of that wider government funding is going to be spent. That might be unfair by the end of this parliament, but it certainly shows you quite how much less is, is being spent in real terms. So what does that mean for the targets, the objectives in the CWIS? Well, the department said they were very stretching targets. 
as if they were kind of set up to fail. The National Audit Office said that uh, it was unlikely they're going to be met. But the starting point, it was never clear how much money was needed to meet those targets in the first place. And there's a report here that uh, was published on the DFT website uh, that was the basis for these the target setting, but there weren't any figures in it suspiciously. Um, so let's see if there's any more information that comes out there about how much money DFT thinks it needs to meet its targets. Um, how am I doing for time, Steve? I've got about four more slides. Is that is that okay? Yeah, you, you're you're absolutely fine. You're just um just over ten minutes in, so you're oh, doing okay. great. Sorry, I've, I've started later than I thought. So obviously, climate change has been in the news a lot. Um, active travel is the only quantified uh, form of modal shift in the carbon budget delivery plan. In plain English, the this plan is the kind of the commitment under the Climate Change Act. The government sets a target and then has to show how it will meet uh, the target in terms of saving emissions from different policies and proposals. Now, things like buses and trains, they're not actually quantified. Active travel is the only part of the transport um, carbon uh, sector where there are savings. And the most recent figures are that transport, surface transport, contributed over 29% of all UK domestic emissions last year. So that's that's a great amount. And the other problem is that um, there's a target set by 2030 to cut emissions by uh, 68%. Well, the latest figures show we're well off meeting that. So the government might say, well, actually, you know, active travel, it's not going to make a huge difference. We don't really need to worry about it. But the thing is, when they're so far behind their targets, we say, actually, it's important. And if you need to do more, active travel is a good area to, to progress this. On to air quality. Um, now, in 2021, uh, the Environment Act was finally passed. It took a long time to get through Parliament. And part of uh, what it does is set new targets for particulates, or PM 2.5. These are the particles often from tyre, road and brake wear uh, that get deep inside your lungs and into your brain. They're actually the most damaging form of air pollution there is. And there's an interim target that's been set for 2028, which is, you know, only a few years away. Um, now, we say that this was uh, a material consideration, you know, something ministers should have had at the front of their mind when they were deciding how to cut the transport budget. The, the answer seems to be from the officials, well, you know, it's enough to consider air quality even though we know that you need to cut traffic, cut motor traffic, if we're going to cut our particulate pollution, because a lot of the pollution, actually the majority in cities, comes from tyre and brake wear, road wear, rather than from exhausts. So this is, I think, the first time the, the new targets have been considered in any, any legal case. Um, and it's also worth flagging that the CWIS itself says that its target to shift urban travel from driving to walking and cycling was key, key to achieving this new particular target. So a bit of a, a question how the Department for Transport is really uh, serious here. And though it might say, well, you know, the active travel target was a really stretching one, we never really planned to achieve it. Well, what's their plan B for meeting this air quality target? Uh, let's see. And then finally, on to equalities. Um, many of you might have heard of the public sector equality duty. Uh, it's not just about people with disabilities. It's also uh, people identify as, as female, uh, people from different backgrounds. Um, and there are you know, as we're as many will be aware, different impacts of 
of transport, you know, for example, school streets, they're particularly beneficial for children who are more at risk uh, if they are, are hit by a car. And it, it really doesn't seem as if the ministers have considered uh, these equalities issues. They've said, well, you know, we can consider equalities issues or, you know, local councils can when it comes to making decisions on individual schemes. But if you cut a lot of the funding at the national strategic level, then, you know, it's that's not good enough, we say. There should have been a, a proper equalities impact assessment before any funding was cut. So I do need um, Chris, who's the director of town, I'm not sure if he's on the call, but um, I do need to flag um, this crowdfunder. TAN is a tiny NGO with about three or four, four and a half people. Uh, it's been doing uh, lots of lots of different work, but unfortunately, or fortunately, we have a fantastic legal team, but we're still a bit short of our funding target to pay for them. Um, and we need to raise another couple of thousand pounds uh, in the next few weeks. So if you can help uh, promote this, uh, that would be really, really appreciated. And we've had donations from across the UK, um, uh, over a thousand pledges already, uh, including many from different walking and cycling groups, which is a really fantastic support that's greatly appreciated. And without which we wouldn't have got to where we are today. But yeah, anything you can do there to help. So in terms of next steps, we have a court hearing uh, next Tuesday in uh, London at the Royal Courts of Justice. There will be a demonstration. Hope the weather will be good at lunchtime. That's at 1.15, uh, a photo call rather than anything the police should worry about, I should add. Um, judgment is unlikely to be given by the judge because these sorts of cases are quite complex. The judges will normally reserve their decision and then publish it a few weeks later. Um, now, in the meantime, CWIS 2 does run out um, in March 2025. So there should be a new uh, cycling walking investment strategy published. The difficulty, of course, is that the current government uh, won't necessarily be in place uh, early next year. So that's something to, to watch about. Now, you might ask, well, why is this case important if there's going to be a new government? Uh, that's because it will set a precedent. It's the first time these issues have been looked at uh, on what government's responsibilities are and the intensity of review um, when deciding, when setting cycling and walking objectives and when deciding how much funding there needs to be for them. So fingers crossed. Um, really, sorry, this was quite a, a rapid um, and disconnected because there's certain kind of key links in the story I'm not really able to talk about. Uh, but hopefully that made sense. But if not, please do ask, please do ask questions and far away. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. That was excellent run through um, and, and obviously brilliant work that you're doing. So we've got a few questions, I think. Um, Adam, you got your hand up very promptly. I've got questions for Rafe, but I'll, I'll hold mine. Adam, you go first. Yeah, I just noticed that you were using like a consumer price or inflationary cost for your um, calculation of loss. But I know that uh, some, um, some councils under Section 106, when they're trying to protect that revenue, they use a different sort of building um, sort of index because the costs in building have gone are astronomical and almost 40%, not 20%. So I was wondering if that's something to consider when presenting this type of stuff, because you're not talking about consumer price index, you're talking about like, so, so, or, or inflation, you're talking about the construction costs, and they've really gone up. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point, Adam. I mean, the 20% figure is from some DFT slides that hopefully uh, will be mentioned next week so that I can share them um, to kind of tell the story better. But um, that was the figure they were using, and it was easier for us simply to, to use their own figures rather than try to introduce other evidence. But certainly by the time we get to 2025, yeah, 40% will be, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, how, how much some of these costs have gone up. 
And Ray, just a quick question before I come to Tim's question in the chat. Um, I because it's a follow on from that. I just wondered you you had a rhetorical question around is a hundred million enough, um, which was clearly one place to all of us. And I think I can probably speak for all 72 people on the call when we say no. And I do remember when we were lobbying hard for Greater Manchester on walking and cycling, we were we were very openly talking about figures between 10 and 15 pounds per capita for the population being an adequate investment, which for Greater Manchester alone would leave you a 35 million a year investment pot re required. Uh, so uh, could you answer your own rhetorical question, Rafe, um, that you had on the slide there? What what do you think of 100 million and where should it be? Well, I mean, I put that slide up there, Steve, because I think there's almost like a default reaction of, of campaigners and, and some NGOs. You know, the government announces some money. We've got to say, oh, thank you. It's very nice. Uh, we kind of like a bit more. And what I was trying to provocatively say, but didn't say, is that actually, if we're serious about meeting these targets, whether it's walking, cycling, air quality, climate, you know, that's a drop in the ocean, even before we start thinking about inflation. And we need to be very clear, you know, <coughs> this is this is the estimate of what we need to have per head, as you say, and this is how much you're doing. So there's this much shortfall. Um, beyond that, uh, talk to me next week this time, and we'll see where we get to. Brilliant. Thanks, Ray. So we've got a question from Tim, which is, um, is this likely to be one of the last decent judicial reviews, um, uh, given the curtailment of the tool, which I think many of us probably didn't know about? And are DFT likely to go for punitive costs? Are they likely to go for, sorry, for? P punitive costs. Uh, well, there's the cost rules are complex, but there's nothing uh, they could do uh, for that. I can't say any more um, at this stage, but I think, yeah, it's not something they could ask for. Uh, there's been nothing they say that we've we've done wrong in terms of process. Uh, what was the first part of the question, sorry? About um, the last Yeah, sort of... Tim, did you want to come in, jump in actually, Tim, yeah, and, and I, explain I'm just that? I'm conscious that our current government say things like, um, lawyers, these these lefty lawyers demanding judicial reviews of everything and Parliament decided and we're going to put an end to that. And what they've been doing, certainly with the Home Office, is rocking up with very, very expensive silks and saying we needed three days and half a million quid to brief our lads. Um, and so if we win on any points, we want that money off you. Um, and I think it was in the most recent protest bill that Judicial review is is under threat. So that that was the ge gen general direction of the travel. So that that's clear now. Thank you for that. Um, so it's worth saying that in environmental cases, there's a thing called a costs cap, um, and you know, of course, certain parts of the government are very unhappy about that. But fortunately, this comes from the Aarhus Convention, but it's not as commonly known within certain politicians is the European Convention, so we haven't heard them saying it should be binned. But for the moment, that means our costs are capped. And that means that it's really a good uh, way to, you know, given the amount of money that's been cut, you know, a few hundred million pounds versus uh, the cost cap, which is 10,000 uh, pounds. This is a really good way to, to challenge without those adverse risks. Great. Thanks, Ray. So I'm going to take Ruth and Bob um, in sequence, actually. Um, so um, assuming they haven't got a huge long list of questions, Ray, in which case that would be unfair. But Ruth, I'll come to you first and then over to you, Bob. OK, thanks, Ray. Very interesting. Um, very quickly. So speaking to Bicycle Dutch in Holland, he would say he can't understand why our the cost of our infra is so, so, so expensive. Um, have you done any kind of analysis of this and things like, for example, several crossings having to have Felicia beacons, which we all know raises the cost hugely and that impacts, and also the cost of our endless consultations, which I know they don't have in the Netherlands. So have you done any kind of work on how they could reduce the costs and therefore get more bang for the buck? Um, we, I mean, there's two issues here. One is about the, the regulations, like the Zebra point you mentioned. Um, I was on the Department for Transport's Traffic Signs 
policy review about 10 years ago, uh, exciting as it sounds, but yeah, that it was really hard to get them to, you know, simplify the regulations. Uh, and that was one area where I failed to get progress. So there's the, the kind of over-regulation or, um, and then there's also the actual cost of delivery in the construction sector in the UK does tend to charge a lot more, whether it's for road building, electrifying trains, and maybe for cycling, we don't actually have any comparable figures. I think it's definitely a good question to ask, what's the cost of building a cycle track for a kilometre in the Netherlands versus the UK? The one thing I'd say finally about consultation, uh, there's a strange uh, contradiction. On the one hand, the government saying we're going to make it very easy to build roads. Um, on the other, they're saying, well, for local low traffic neighbourhoods, we need lots of consultation surveys. So it's for the kind of the healthy stuff. They're trying to make it as difficult as possible. And for the kind of planet busting stuff, it's really expensive. They're trying to make it as easy and quick as possible. That I'd say is bonkers, but yeah. Uh, very well put, Ray. Thank you very much. Right, I am going to take Bob and then H and you are the final two, I'm afraid. Um, then we'll move on to Leo, who's going to present as well. So, Bob. Bob, you're on mute. mute. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Thanks. Just a quickie on the amount of money. Um, there's something in the chat about the IPPR report arguing for about 20 billion overall. I think um, the woman from who heads up Cycling UK was arguing that there should be about six billion on active travel, I think, over the next five years or so. So those are the kind of figures that have been talked about. And certainly sort of hundred million pounds a year is is, you know, pretty hopeless, really. Um, Thanks. OK, that's that. Thanks, Bob. Really good. Yeah, totally agree. Right. H, final comment. And then, Rafe, if you've got any last thoughts, we'll, we'll uh, wrap up with you. I think we hang on. Oh, hello. Yeah, it's all right. Have you got me now? We yeah, have got you, H. You're loud and clear. Right. Just um, reflecting on an economist, a 19th century economist called Henry George, uh, and land value uh, uplifts when you get good transport. And um, basically, Dave Wetzel was quite keen on this because he figured out you could have built the Jubilee line four times over from the land value uplift from the adjoining properties. And we noticed this where um, at the Pinellas Trail 30 years ago in Florida, where the commercial properties suddenly got filled and premium rental as soon as the cycle route opened. And is there a way that the land value uplift that comes from having good quality cycle routes and uh, active travel in an area can be captured and not sucked out by the developers and the um, remotely operated companies to put into the infrastructure? In other words, you, you build a housing estate, you build a cycle. The cycle route that's built with the housing estate is paid for by the developer because they get more money for the houses on the estate for having a cycle route next to them. And that goes back to a 1988 survey on the Burke Gilman Trail in Seattle. House values were improved by being next to the cycle route. Brilliant, thanks H. So Rafe, question there, land value uplift, can we factor that in? Um, I mean, it's a, it's a very important point that we know whoever kind of the, the two main parties post-election aren't gonna have lots of cash. We do need to find some new funding streams, uh, especially given the figures I talked about, you know, the billions of pounds per year, whether land value capture or, you know, land value taxation. I mean, I'd quite like to see um, capture of, of, of car parking costs to, to pay for more active travel infrastructure. Um, but I think it's probably something that needs a separate conversation because I have to get some economists uh, along uh, to work out some solutions. Uh, but yeah, I think definitely we need to think to think of some new funding streams are uh, for CUS3. And Brilliant. very Thank finally, um, yeah, I should say that the CU in court was kind of rhetorical because the court doesn't have a huge amount of space. Um, it's not like some sort of show trial for the DFT, very much though I'd like to have a show trial of how they've decimated the active travel budget. Um, so there's only gonna be space for a couple of journalists and our legal team 
but uh, we will try to tweet and to share as much news as possible. And we are keen to see people um, at lunchtime, although preferably in normal clothing rather than looking like any any, any sort of particular um, kind of cycling clothing, just so that it, it looks more normal if I can, make, if I can say that. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much. I'll try and catch up with the chat. I see the 61 messages. And I'll try and uh, <laughs> take part with that while I listen to Leo. Thanks, I'm sure will be excellent. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think that will come next. So thank you everyone for your time. Great to see so many people here. And please cross your fingers for us next Tuesday. Brilliant. Good luck with it, Rafe. Absolutely excellent. And thanks for get chuck, getting stuck into the chat uh, and answering Charlotte's question in particular, which was about whether the people can come along and support. Um, brilliant. Well, that's us done with Rafe. Thank you, Rafe. Uh, Leo, we're over to you next. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Now, I should I have to caveat this. that I was hoping that by this point, what I would be doing is sharing a link with you all that you could um, immediately go and do something with off the back of this presentation. I'm not quite there yet because we still have to kick the tires on it one last time. Um, and I've got a meeting with my data this guy and Coda who has built this thing next week. So I will be back to another active travel cafe in the next couple of weeks, just to let everybody know it's gone live and to, sh and to share the link and we'll, we'll get it into the, uh, into the, uh, the mail out that comes out of Active Travel Cafe. But I'm going to use the slot that I have, um, that I booked for today to tell you what it is, what 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 it is it that I'm here talking about. So um, you will all be aware that it's like, basically we all know that the school run is a massive contributor to particularly morning peak traffic, right? So this is like common knowledge. It's not, very well supported by data. There's a stat that probably everybody on this call has heard, which is T TFL estimated in 2018, that 25% of the cars on the road in the weekday morning peak in London are parents on the school run. Um, there isn't really a comparable, there's very, there's very few, there's very little else out there. I, I see that stat repeated quite a lot. Um, but, there's a you know there there are some other data sources like we know the insurers admiral report 26% fewer road traffic collisions during school holidays um and there's a spike in casualties every september when schools return after summer yeah. um 4300 child pedestrian casualties on uk roads in 2021 and uh, transport for london reckons that a third of children's road traffic injuries um in london take place on the way to or from school so um this is a this is a problem we know is there but it's not particularly well substantiated and then there's another layer to this which again it will be familiar to people on this call which is that anecdotally people do report much quieter roads with greatly reduced congestion in the vicinity of private schools during private school holidays and that makes sense because they're non-catchment schools. And so they tend to have children attending from a much wider geographical area. And the school communities are wealthier. They're more likely to have access to a car. They're more likely to choose to travel by car than state school communities. So it stacks up. It makes sense. But it's not something that we have been able to substantiate with data. Now, British private schools typically have longer school holiday periods than state schools. So they generally will clock off each half term a week or more early throughout the year. And that is the window where you can see, you know, anecdotally, this is where you see that your local roads seem to have become a lot less congested, even though the state schools are still in school. So in inspired by this, um, I've been working with our data lead, Duncan Gear, at Possible, um, on an idea uh, for a few months, actually. And we've recruited a coder to help us do it. Uh, the School Run Cruncher. So this is this is what I'm here to tell you about. Um, and this is going to be a year-long project, which will start this term. What we're doing is analysing locations that local advocates and campaigners have observed 
there to be less traffic during school holidays and plugging those into the Google Maps API so that every day during the rush hour, it sends requests for the journey time for that route. So we are aiming to do this for at least 100 locations, um, potentially more than that. Um, but we want to get at least 100 locations. It very much depends on local knowledge um, of people who pay attention to this stuff, which is why it was so important to me to book a slot at the Active Traveller ca Cafe, because uh, people on this call are exactly the people we're looking to to suggest locations for analysis, right? Um, so it's not rocket science at all, this. Um, it is simply, uh, we, we've made a Google form, which is the data uh, entry. And um, what you need to do is put in, it uses the Google Maps, um, the distance matrix. It's capable of generating journey times from multiple uh, road routes. Um, and it will, once you've inputted your initial data, it's just automated and it will just do it every weekday for a year. So the goal is to get 100 plus locations this term inputted so that the system starts carrying out the analysis through the summer holidays and then we will run it for a full school year so all the way through 24 25 and then publish the findings in september 2025 um at the start of the school year that's the idea now we hope to have enough locations to be able to draw some wider inferences about the role of school run traffic in morning peak congestion in general, but also about potentially the disproportionate role of private school run traffic. Um, we That's our hypothesis, but we're testing that. We don't know if it's true or not. Um, but also we should be able to produce, um, you know, nicely designed interim uh, reports as well as final reports for each of the locations that people have submitted for analysis. So you will be able to say to local officers and councillors that, well, actually, you know, look at a year of data, X amount of the congestion in the morning on this road is being caused by school run traffic that is associated with specific schools. So um, we're asking you for the locations uh, so specifically a route. So you have to put in the beginning and the end of the route. The form tells you what sort of distance is appropriate. It's about half a mile to two miles is what you're looking for. You don't really want routes that have lots of alternative uh, potential routes to travel because um, the Google Maps might get confused, start rerouting journeys. Um, but... Uh, then you also need the state on the school. So you need the locations of the schools that you suspect might be causing the traffic. Um, and you need the, uh, you need their, their, their locations and, uh, their postcodes, ideally their websites, um, the type of school that they are, the age range that's catered to, uh, the school hours. So when do the school gates open and close? Um, and the term dates, crucially, the term dates are absolutely essential. Um, so the form is pretty intuitive. Uh, it's quite easy to fill out. It does take a while because we're asking you to identify every school that might be implicated in the traffic you've observed. Right. So um, that that's it. That's the school run cruncher. We are I'm very, very pleased to say that we are going to be doing this in partnership with the wonderful Solve the School Run folks who are here on this call so nicola and claire um give everyone a wave i know that i know they're on this call so this is a possible and solve the school run uh collaboration um it will require lots of input from the wider director of travel community during this coming term and then no one will need to do anything at all the robot will do its work and um in about a year's time so before we public public size anything my goal is to come back to an active travel cafe and report what we found you know before we actually put this out to press um so we can ha just have a chat about it i'd be amazed if the hypothesis is completely wrong but you know it might be it might vary geographically there's all sorts of interesting things we might discover from this 
We are also talking to Anna Goldman about the potential for this to underpin um, some academic work. But the challenge there is that in order to do that, you'd need a lot of research and time to select locations, right? Rather than relying on crowdsourcing suggestions from campaigners, um, because that will build in some bias at the outset or, or potentially build in some bias at the outset. But, um, you know, it is actually... It, it's definitely got the scope to underpin some peer-reviewed work. Um, but in the first instance, we just think this is going to be very useful for all of us, specifically in advocating for school streets. But, um, you know, also just what wider measures, substantiating that there is a problem uh, and who, if anyone, is responsible for doing something about it um, and just using this as a tool to advocate for... Um, for measures both at schools and at local authorities to support people to switch so that is everything that i wanted to say um and i'll be back either next week or probably the week after next actually um to share the link to the form we'll get it into the newsletter um and we're not going to throw it out more widely right i'm just going to circulate this through our network but everyone on this call probably knows someone else who might be interested in this that isn't on this call that's how, that's how we want to do this, right? Um, it's going to be very dependent on them, um, you know, bottom-up intel, local intel. Um, so starting from streets that we, we think we know that there's a problem on and then getting the robot to check if it's true. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Leo. That's excellent. So um, we've got a couple of questions. First of all, in the chat, Leo, can, um, Cameron's asked, um, about last November, a number of people inputted to this and filled in a questionnaire yeah. for the room. Will that still be logged or do they need to do this form again for you? Oh, Cameron, you won't need to do it again. Your location seems to be working well. So I'd hope, like I say, to have pulled out the early findings from the, we've got a, a half a dozen locations which were run in the test. But so far, it doesn't look like there's any issues with the setup from the beginning. So like I say, we're kicking the tires with the code the next week, but we don't think there's any problems, in which case we will just continue to run the analysis for the locations that have already been submitted. So we've got about eight in there now, so nine, 92 to go. Brilliant. Brilliant. Cheers. Brilliant. Brilliant. Good stuff. And um, I'm pleased to say Brendan's posted in some links in the chat, Leo, to evidence based from elsewhere on private schools Excellent. versus public schools, uh, uh, adding to the rush out disproportionately. Um, and um, not that we're political on Active Travel Cafe, but if any of us didn't particularly like the public school system, that's making us all feel very good. Um, anybody else got any questions? Not that we're political on Active Travel Cafe, of course. Um, anybody else got any other questions or thoughts for Leo before I wrap us up? I think that's everything. We'll wait for that update, Leo. And it goes without saying, yes, of course, we will share that out on our channels and make sure that people are contributing. Really good stuff. Fabulous. Yeah, I'm excited about it. It's like an obvious thing to do. No one's done it. So let's do it. Excellent. And good to know about your partnership with Solved School Run because Nicola and Claire have presented to our old Gus buddy and everybody got really excited about their presentation when they did it. So that's brilliant stuff. Good. Yeah. Thank you, Leo. I think that's all us all done for this Tuesday evening. Got through loads there. That's really brilliant. Please do join us next week when, are you ready to get a hot under the colour? It's a deep dive on pavement parking. Nothing gets as angry apart from that and the school run, honestly. So please join us again next week. Um, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to all of you who added to the news roundup. That's really brilliant. Thanks, everybody, for turning up. We'll see you soon. Take care, everybody. See you.